And yet, even as motion and change became a way of life in Manhattan, an even greater transformation was underway. Between 1898 and 1913, the human and physical and political landscape of the city would be transformed beyond recognition. During that time, the entire world would arrive on the city's doorstep, and most of those who came would be changed utterly by what they found there. But in the end, nothing would be more moving or prove to have more lasting consequences for the city and the nation than the changes the newcomers themselves would bring to the life of New York City. In little more than a decade, the 20th century itself would be born on the streets of New York, and nothing would ever be the same again. Well, I think one of the great things about New York is it's not a static thing. It's not New York is. New York is always becoming. It's becoming physically as buildings are torn down and, and changed much more so than any other American city. But it's also always becoming in terms of what it is in something we can't see, in the, the culture of the city. So the immigrants came to New York City, especially in these large numbers between the 1880s and 1920s, and made it their own. Made it a kind of place that the world had never seen before. Made it where there were more Italians than they, in New York than there were in Naples. I mean, there were more Irish than in Dublin, more Greeks than in Athens. And it was an incredible experience because the city was so vast and so many of these immigrants were there that the city was open to these changes. Uh, so that even today, what is New York? It's more than a mosaic, it's a new kind of city. If you were living in New York in those years at the turn of the century, you knew it was happening right there uh, in front of you, uh, in, in, your, in your village. And of course it disturbed many people didn't like it. Uh, they thought it was going to ruin the country, and they were wrong. It began in the 1880s, spurred on by poverty and persecution, by financial panic and political upheaval, by family strife and personal woe. They came not from Northern Europe this time, but from the East and from the South. Italians, Jews, Greeks, and Poles Russians, Hungarians, Ukrainians, Armenians, and Turks. Out of the remote and little-known reaches of Europe, one awestruck observer wrote, marches a vast and endless army. It was a huge human tide, and coming on all the time, year after year, and growing. In 1907, uh, 1,200,000 people, 1,200,000 people came into the city of New York from Europe, primarily. There were 289,000 of them from Italy alone, 256,000 from Russia, just in one year. And in the long run, they gave us more than they got. One way or the other, they had all heard the same thing. There was freedom and opportunity in America for anyone willing to work. And the place with the most jobs was the sprawling, unfathomably large seaport of New York. For most, it meant leaving everything familiar behind. The day I left home, my mother came with me to the railroad station. When we said goodbye, she said it was like seeing me go into my casket. I never saw her again. Yulia Goniprov, 1899. There was a sense that the city, a message that the city whispered to its people and to people from all over the United States. You know, come here, everything is possible. Now, that's a seductive sound. This is a seductive whisper. Now, a lot of people failed at it, but at least the promise was there. 
there's always been a feeling of promise in New York. And the promise is there because it is the entrance city. It's the beginning. But I still think of it as a city to which, as James Joyce said about his characters, here comes everybody. About four or five o'clock in the morning, we all got up. The whole boat bent toward her because everybody went out. Everybody. She was beautiful with the sunshine so bright and so big and everybody was crying. The captain came and said, please everybody, we should move a little bit to the center. But nobody would move. The thrill was unbelievable, but always the fear, because you have to go through Ellis Island. I heard all kinds of things that they would tell you on the boat. God, I said, I hope they're not going to send me back. Joseph Talese. For decades, immigrants to New York had come through Castle Garden, a ramshackle state-run depot at the foot of Manhattan. But by 1890, the one-time concert hall had been completely overwhelmed by the tidal wave of new immigrants. And work had begun on a massive new federal installation, far out in the harbor, on an abandoned ammunition dump called Ellis Island. On December 17th, 1900, the massive complex of brick, stone, and steel was finally complete. Built to accommodate a half million people a year, it was soon handling twice that number, sometimes as many as 12,000 a day. In 30 years, 12 million people would stream through the great echoing registry room, hoping to find sanctuary and a new beginning in America. More than 4 million of them would settle permanently in New York, tripling its population in less than a single lifetime. Emigration made us huge. You, you could never have bred yourself into 8 million people in uh, 50 years. Uh, emigration did it. Uh, it also made for an industrial city. Uh, people who were arriving were from the farms in the main, arriving here in curious reversals. It was when the wheat from Kansas began arriving in the Baltic that peasant population there became surplus. They turned around and arrived here. On disembarking, the pilgrims entered a vast, bewildering, impersonal machine, an assembly line for processing immigrants. With numbered tags pinned to their clothes, they were swiftly herded into long lines, then ushered inside the main building by harried immigration officials who barked orders at them in dozens of different tongues. Inspectors were required by law to turn back polygamists, paupers, criminals, and the mentally ill as well as anyone with a heart condition or a physical disability.